Uh, welcome to KEI's March 30th, 2020 webinar on the state of human rights in North Korea. I'm Mark Tokola, the vice president of KEI. KEI was founded in 1982 for the purpose of promoting mutual understanding between the United States and the Republic of Korea. We're based in Washington, DC. If you'd like to see more about our programs and events, uh, you can find us on keia.org. We'll be doing more online events to try to make up for our inability to host in-person events during this time of pandemics. So if you watch our website, you'll see more upcoming events that I hope you'll join. Uh, the order of the event today is I'll make a few scene setting remarks and then have some questions for our guests and then we'll answer as many of your questions as possible. So please use the Zoom Q&A function to ask your questions, address them to specific people if you'd like, and you can start submitting questions anytime you like. We have two outstanding panelists with us today. First, Ambassador Robert King, who is a special envoy for North Korean human rights and humanitarian assistance. We're proud to have him now as a KEI non-resident fellow. Ambassador King is literally irreplaceable. Uh, the Trump administration has not chosen to replace him. We might talk more about why that is later in the conversation. And if Ambassador King is irreplaceable, our other guest, Greg Scarlatu, is invaluable. Uh, he is the Executive Director of Human Rights North Korea, HRNK. Uh, the brand new State Department report on North Korean human rights that came out this month quoted six HRNK reports 13 times. His organization is one of the premier human rights organizations. Okay, to set the scene a little bit, uh, people have known for decades that there were serious human rights abuses in North Korea. But prior to 2014, there was a debate about how widespread those abuses were and whether defector accounts might be exaggerated. Now that changed with this watershed report. The UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea conducted an extensive, thoroughly documented investigation and issued this report. The Commission of Inquiry in 2014 found that North Korea was engaged in systematic, widespread, and gross human rights violations amounting to crimes against humanity. The commission also found that these violations were being conducted under the effective control of Kim Jong-un. Exactly what's happening in North Korea can be analyzed and discussed, but no one can now doubt that widespread human rights violations continue. The commission of inquiry report is still relevant, but it's now over five years old. So how do we know what's happened since? Well, the State Department issues an annual country report on human rights. The latest report on North Korea came out this month on March 11th. The Trump administration has been muted in his criticism of human rights in North Korea since the diplomatic summitry that began in 2018. But the State Department's new report is as tough on North Korea as were the 2018 and 2017 reports. That has not changed. Okay, this is the summary paragraph from the State Department's March 2020 report on human rights in North Korea. I'm not gonna read it all to you, but you can see just skimming it that it confirms the Commission of Inquiry's findings of systematic state-directed human rights violations that continue of all sorts. I'll point to just a couple of other reports. Uh, you can't dismiss concern over human rights violations in North Korea by claiming that we don't know what's happening there. Uh, we know a lot. This is a special report that came out in May of 2019 from the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And this report uh, called The Price is Rights was specifically about the human rights problems being created by the fact that North Koreans are being pushed onto a semi-legal market. They're in constant jeopardy of being arrested for crimes only because they're trying to survive. That puts almost every North Korean at risk. And finally, this is the latest version of the annual report put out by South Korea's Institute for National Unification or KINU. This report's over 500 pages long. It includes information on the reality of civil and political rights in North Korea, the economic, social, and cultural rights problems. Uh, it identifies which groups are especially vulnerable in North Korea. And it talks about major issues, including pr political prison camps and corruption. Okay, I'm hoping to address three general questions today during our conversation. First is, what is the current situation in North Korea? Are there signs of improvement or worsening of human rights? Second, is there a trade-off between negotiations with North Korea on denuclearization and continue to press North Korea on human rights. We have to make that choice. And finally, a third, is there anything outside countries, organizations, and individuals can do to help? So let me start the conversation with a question for Bob. 
of course, we have to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, shouldn't our focus be on healthcare in North Korea rather than human rights? Uh, it seems to me that we're in a situation where we can both walk and chew gum. Uh, we should be able to focus on the problem of healthcare in North Korea, which is a major issue and which is something we ought to be dealing with. But at the same time, it seems to me that we ought to be able to look at human rights and focus on human rights and give attention to that issue as well. I would argue that there's a connection between the two. Uh, one of the real problems in North Korea is lack of information, which is a human right. People in North Korea ought to be able to have access to information. And if they're going to have a good sense of the nature of the healthcare system and how to improve it, how to make it more functional, we need to have information about what's going on and that information needs to be available. Okay, uh, Bob, if I can follow up with you. Uh, the UN Secretary General Guterres and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Mikhail Bakalet, have both called for a lifting of sanctions on North Korea to help North Korea deal with the pandemic. Uh, I'm sure Kim Jong-un was very happy to hear that recommendation. Uh, <clears throat> sanctions are not, uh, they're not either on or off you can have sanctions lifted for certain areas or certain products or certain goods. And in fact, the UN sanctions specifically state that there should be uh, an opportunity for healthcare and other kinds of things, uh, products and, and, and goods to be able to ship, to be shipped into North Korea. So I'd argue, yeah, as far as healthcare, the, the items that are essential for healthcare in North Korea should be allowed to go in. And in fact, there are indications they are going in. Uh, the International Federation of the Red Cross, for example, was allowed to ship uh, 10,000 training kits and other issue, uh, other materials that are useful for the North Koreans in handling the COVID e epidemic. So I'd say, yeah, we need to lift sanctions on specific items that are necessary for dealing with the healthcare problems, but that doesn't mean we lift sanctions as well on uh, nuclear and missile uh, items that are helpful for the North Koreans. Okay, uh, Greg, would you like to comment on that? Uh, maybe you could also talk about the connection between North Korea's abuse of human rights and the pandemic. You know, for example, are there conditions in prison camps that exacerbate the problem? Well, certainly here in the United States, um, the, uh, the experts who drafted the sanctions were very careful to include humanitarian exceptions in those sanctions. The sanctions are certainly not meant to uh, target the people of North Korea. Uh, the sanctions are meant to prevent the development and proliferation of North Korean nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles and to punish the elites in charge of their development and proliferation by severing their access to luxury goods imported from the outside world. As Ambassador King has pointed out, humanitarian organizations, including uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Doctors Without Borders, or the International Federation of uh, Red Crescent and Red Cross Societies, have already been granted exemptions. Um, certainly, I, I fully agree with Ambassador King that um, public health is a human rights issue in North Korea. The state of human security in North Korea has been terrible for the past uh, 25 plus 30 years at the very least. The fact that uh, food security in North Korea is a problem, the fact that the people of North Korea are food insecure, the fact that one third of North Korea's children suffer from malnutrition, from nutritional deficiencies, definitely increase the vulnerability of the people of North Korea to infectious disease. According to the late Hwang jang yop the highest ever defector to come down to South Korea, this was the top ideologue of the North Korean regime. As many as 2 million people died in the Great Famine of the mid to the late 1990s. Not all of them died of starvation, Many of them died of disease induced by starvation because immune systems were certainly down due to immune deficiencies. What we're learning here in the United States and elsewhere in the developed world is that it's very important to be uh, able to uh, basically, uh, well, 
it may be a, a controversial ex uh, expression, but shelter in place, one needs the resources to hold the fort for a while. The very fact that the mobility is stri very uh, strictly um, uh, controlled and restricted in North Korea, the very fact that food security and economic security are precarious, all of these mean that the people of North Korea are less prepared to deal with a, uh, a public health crisis uh, possibly triggered by the coronavirus. Speaking of detention facilities, our colleagues at Daily NK issued a couple of reports uh, stating that um, respiratory infections have been reported at uh, Kyo Hwa So uh, training, well, forced labor camp number 12 in Chonggori, North Korea. We cannot tell whether this is COVID-19 coronavirus. Again, even compared to other people in North Korea, the human security of prisoners is so precarious. Uh, they've been suffering from respiratory infections uh, for a long time. At this stage, we just cannot tell. One argument that this organization, HRNK, has continued to make is that we need a rights up front approach to North Korea. If humanitarian organizations are involved in North Korea, they must remember to reach out to the most vulnerable. Who are the most vulnerable? Certainly people in detention, certainly those 120,000 political prisoners, including men, women, and children who are all detained together due to North Korea's Yonjaje system of guilt by association. Okay, um, Bob, I know you've been directly involved in negotiating North Korea on how to get assistance to them in, back in the food assistance days. So if we do give medical supplies to North Korea and if they're willing to accept them, how can we make sure that they are used for the purpose they're intended for, not stockpiled or sold? I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, I want to hear this. This is one of the important issues that I think we need to consider when, when we're providing assistance to North Korea. When we were looking at the possibility of providing food aid uh, at one point uh, in 2011-2012, uh, that was one of the things we had uh, serious discussions with the North Koreans on, is how can we monitor to make sure the food is going to those that are most in need. I think it's essential that we do it as well with medical care. Uh, North Korea is not uh, it wants to be treated differently. The rest of the world, that's one of the issues we do when we provide assistance. We assure that it goes to those that are most in need, make sure that it goes where it's intended. Uh, and requiring that of the North Koreans is not doing anything different for North Korea than we would do for any other country. We need to make clear that that's part of the process, that if we're going to provide humanitarian assistance, if we're going to provide medical aid, we need to be able to be sure that it's going to areas where the, the need is the greatest. And uh, this is something that the North Koreans need to understand, and we need to be hard-nosed as we negotiate with them on those issues. But that ought to be an essential part of any uh, uh, agreement with the North Koreans on providing uh, medical assistance. Yeah, my, my colleague Troy Stangero made the interesting point too that we need to look at relative need. It may be there are countries that actually are more of need of assistance than North Korea is. So it's a relative thing. You know, if we can help North Korea, we should, but compared to other countries, is it the highest priority? Well, the North Koreans right now are claiming they have no cases of uh, COVID virus. Uh, I suspect that that's not the case. Kim Jong-un is now uh, building a hospital that's supposed to be finished, a brand new hospital in Pyongyang that's supposed to be finished by uh, the fall. Uh, that seems to suggest that there are, in fact, expectations that the situation is either getting bad or going to get worse. Uh, and we need to be aware of that. Okay, um, Greg, you talked about uh, North Korea's dealing with its population. But what is their record in delivering assistance to the population? I mean, I've seen it argued the North Korean healthcare system is actually pretty good, if, if, if uh, under resourced. They've got a lot of doctors, uh, there are a lot of clinics. So, is this massive North Korean state bureaucracy actually well structured to deal with the pandemic? 
Mark, up until 30 years ago, the North Korean uh, public health system may have been on par with uh, the public uh, health system of other communist countries. Of course, still corrupt in some ways, perhaps working. Uh, I have my own personal story. In April 1986, I was a high school student in communist Romania. That's when Chernobyl happened. The regime of Nikolai Ceausescu, as terrible as it was, was able to distribute iodine pills to each and every school child at the time, as soon as they announced, of course, late, a few days late. However, for the past 30 years, the North Korean system, the North Korean public health system has been in shambles. Resources have been concentrated on those areas that are regarded by the regime as critical to its own survival, the military, nuclear weapons, missiles, keeping the elites happy through access to goods imported from the outside world. Uh, the, uh, the, the public health and the health security of the people of North Korea has been neglected. And in order to, um, uh, to uh, illustrate that, I, I have actually uh, prepared this, this picture right here. This is the picture I'm looking for. This is a oh. picture taken in the aftermath of Typhoon Lion Rock um, a few years ago in North Korea. North Korea is very hard hit by Typhoon Lion Rock. Remember, this is a regime that uh, invests in building high risers downtown Pyongyang. Uh, ballistic missiles has placed at least one object um, into outer space, uh, nuclear weapons. On the other hand, these men are involved in post-disaster recovery outside Pyongyang, North Korea. Do you notice anything striking about this picture, Mark and Bob? There's not much equipment. There's no machinery there. Absolutely. No tools. You don't see an excavator, a bulldozer. Goodness, not even a shovel. shovel. These men are empty-handed. Oh. This is how the regime invests in the welfare and human security of the people of North Korea. There is no investment. Now, systemically, uh, is this humongous bureaucracy uh, equipped to deal with a public health crisis of the magnitude of a coronavirus crisis? One has to remember that the system is geared first and foremost to keep people under control. This is not a line of chain of command of technocrats who can make independent decisions within a world of technocrats. Party guidance trumps everything else. Doctors, hospitals, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, they must be obedient to the party, so they work under the strict surveillance of the party. They work under the strict surveillance of internal security agencies. While the system is equipped to uh, keep people under control, oppressed, uh, and maintain the regime in power, one tremendous vulnerability of this system is that for that very reason, it is not equipped to deal with a natural disaster or a, a public health crisis, a pandemic on par with what a coronavirus crisis could look like in North Korea. Okay, I should have said at the start too, that you know, Bob and Greg, feel free to address each other too. I'm not the master of ceremonies, I'm just a humble moderator. So if you have things you wanna say, chime in. Um, Bob, I was gonna ask you about what effect the pandemic is having on North Korean defectors or, or refugees. So that seems like it'd be a specific case these days. What can the U.S. do in regard to refugees at this time of border crossings? Uh, the refugees are probably uh, very seriously affected by, by what's going on. Numbers have gone down the last year or two. Uh, the numbers have declined significantly. Uh, my guess is it's much more difficult to get out of North Korea now uh, than it was uh, even a year ago. Uh, North Koreans are guarding the borders carefully. The Chinese are probably much tougher on the border than they were before. It's going to be much more difficult for them to get into China 
But then the other problem they will have is they've got to go through China to get out in most cases in, into Southeast Asia. And uh, crossing China at a time when uh, travel is being limited and travel is being carefully watched, I think the numbers of defectors leaving North Korea is likely to decline very significantly uh, over the period of time, the three or four months that we've had when the pandemic has been going on. And I think that's gonna continue. Uh, I am sure that uh, those who are uh, captured by North Korean guards or those who are repatriated from uh, China back to North Korea are going to be more subject uh, to conditions that would lead to their uh, having problems and, and uh, becoming ill with, uh, with the coronavirus. Okay, I'll see. Um... One question I've had myself is why North Korea won't admit to having any cases of COVID-19. They admit things in the past, they admitted to having swine flu, uh, they've admitted to floods and droughts, so why their secrecy about this case? I, I've been wondering if it's just because they don't know what to do, that until they have a plan where they can announce it and carry through with dealing with patients, maybe they're afraid to admit they have it. Do you have any ideas about why they're not telling the truth about this? Greg? Or well, uh, certainly, uh, first and foremost, uh, we will have to see whether North Korea is treating this as a real crisis or as a PR opportunity. Mm -hmm. We see that North Korean propaganda has issued instructions, uh, for example, uh, not to gather in public spaces. Uh, they've admonished public officials who have been caught drinking consuming alcohol during this crisis. Uh, so there is the PR aspect for it. the regime surely wants to look good. There is another aspect here. Um, if a crisis does indeed happen, one has to remember that there are media organizations that even have stringers inside the country right now contacting on a combination of smuggled Chinese cell phone and official North Korean cell phone. This is not the 1990s. If a crisis does happen, information will get out of the country. Now, by issuing all of these fatwas, so to say, all of these instructions, what the regime is trying to do is to position itself where it can say that it did try very hard to prevent this crisis. Now, Indeed, on previous occasions, they did admit to droughts, to flooding, natural disasters. Uh, a little bit early, a few minutes ago, I quoted Huang zhang -yop. Huang zhang -yop was the one who also made this point in his memoirs. He said, South Koreans wonder why, as North Koreans were dying by the hundreds of thousands and the millions, they did not rise up against the regime. The point that Huang zhang yop made was that North Koreans in the 1990s did not regard this as a man-made disaster. To a large extent, although there were floods and natural disasters, this was a disaster caused by the very regime of North Korea. For as long as they're dealing with an event that can be described as a, a natural disaster, the regime of North Korea does not regard it as potentially posing a direct threat to, uh, to its legitimacy within North Korea. But of course, I hope that we will have more opportunities to discuss the potential effects of a coronavirus crisis on the North Korean regime, on the viability of the North Korean regime, and um, Quite, quite frankly, on, on the future of, uh, of the regime in North Korea. So the reasons why they've, uh, they've kept quiet could be complex. The bottom line, of course, is that in order to determine how many cases there are out there, one has to test. We have no information about testing in North Korea. We know that North Korean statisticians are very good at doctoring data. They do not know that their own statistical data. Of course, this is a huge obstacle in the way of collaborating with multilateral, bilateral international humanitarian agencies. This is a big obstacle in the way of collaborating with private humanitarian agencies that might be out there in North Korea. Yeah. Uh, Mark? 
please. It seems to me that the legitimacy of the government is very much in question in terms of how it handles uh, the coronavirus uh, issue in, in North Korea. And that's true as well in the United States. I mean, even here where information is much more available, where people are paying attention, where uh, things are known, uh, there are efforts by our own government to keep the numbers down. Uh, don't let the cruise ship land because it'll increase the number of people who are in the United States who have the virus. Uh, we're dealing with that in spades uh, when you're dealing with North Korea, where the government has the ability to control uh, the media much more so than is the case here. Okay, well, as, as Greg said, we could talk about the coronavirus, what it means for North Korea a long time, but I wanna step back to the more general uh, human rights issues now. Uh, Greg, I know HRNK has done some recent work on camp number one in uh, Kechong. So could you tell us a little bit about, about that work and maybe put in the context of other prisons in North Korea? Is there a difference between regular prisons and political prison camps? This is part of a much broader project we've been running for the past uh, seven years together with uh, senior satellite imagery consultant, uh, Joe Bermudez Jr. This is the latest installment in this long-term project. Uh, Camp number one, Ketun in Northeastern North Korea is a Kyohua So labor training camp. There are multiple types of detention facilities in North Korea. One fundamental difference between the Kuali So political prison camps and the other detention facilities, Kyohua So labor training camps, Nodong Talyonde um, encampment slash mobile labor brigade, Chikyoso short term detention facilities, Kuryujang police detention facilities. The fundamental difference is that each and every one of those up to 120,000 political prisoners at the Kualiso political prison camps are the victims of enforced disappearances. They're taken away in the middle of the night. They disappear into the political prison camp systems. One point that uh, HRNK report author David Hawk has made in his hidden gulag reports and the parallel gulag report is that sometimes these prisoners become for a second time the victims of the enforced disappearances when camps in the border areas are shut down and they're relocated to other facilities, other political prison camps. One big difference between the quality so political prison camps and the other detention facilities is that at the other detention facilities, there are actual prison sentences. The prisoners do go through a semblance of judicial process. This particular facility, Kyohua So, labor training camp number one in Ketun, northeastern North Korea, as far as we can tell, is the oldest Kyohua So labor training camp in North Korea through declassified uh, CIA satellite imagery from the early 1960s, through imagery collected and analyzed over the past few years, we made the determination that forced labor has continued at the camp for more than half a century. In this particular case, last year, we are also able to conduct interviews with former prisoners who escaped from North Korea and currently reside in South Korea. One lady in particular uh, shared with us very troubling testimony. This is testimony about bodies being dumped in the fields and used as fertilizer around the Ketun number one uh, detention facility um, labor training camp in North Korea. What this regrettably tells us is that conditions, human rights conditions at these detention facilities in North Korea today are as bad as they were when the UN Commission of Inquiry issued its report in February 2014, they're as bad as they were when Venezuelan poet Ali Lameda was held in North Korea's political prison uh, uh, facilities in the late 60s, 
early 70s. He was, of course, the first one to come out of the system and, and report on the abysmal human rights violations happening within this vast system of unlawful imprisonment. Uh, Bob, anything to add to that description of the situation? My sense is that Greg does an extremely good job. Uh, 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 the uh, Commission for, uh, Committee for Human Rights in North Korea is certainly one of the best organizations that documents what's going on. And I think the documentation that they provided, the continuing reports that they provide, are extremely useful in terms of providing the specifics of what's going on. Uh, in particular, having the uh, satellite imagery that Joe Bermudez provides uh, gives a credibility and an authenticity uh, that simple uh, reports from individuals who've been held there uh, have difficulty conveying. So, I mean, I think it's, it's an extremely good relationship that uh, uh, and, uh, HRNK has worked out uh, that documents what's been going on. Okay, so to turn from that to the uh, politics, a little bit in the administration. So Bob, is it important for the administration to be speaking out on the, at the top levels about North Korean human rights violations or is working level reporting and pressure enough out of the public eye? Um, unfortunately, uh, the administration has taken the point of view that the only way we're gonna make progress with North Korea on the nuclear issue is if we back off on human rights. I'm not convinced that that's the case. <clears throat> North Korea <coughs> North Korea is the place where control of information is extremely important in terms of its own internal operations. And the ability to control information, the ability to handle uh, and keep its people in line is far more important to them uh, than the relationship with the United States. Uh, I don't think there's any question that if we're going to make progress uh, in terms of, pro uh, of moving North Korea uh, towards denuclearization, towards uh, improving the relationship with the United States with other countries, it's going to have to be a situation where the North Koreans uh, are under some pressure from their own people. And the only way that we're going to put pressure on the North Korean regime is if we increase the access to information, if we uh, provide uh, uh, pressure, put pressure on the North Koreans uh, for the human rights violations that they're guilty of. So I would argue that uh, in fact, uh, we have to, again, walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to press the North Koreans on human rights. At the same time, we need to work with them and, and cooperate with them to try to make progress on, uh, on denuclearization, on uh, reducing the missile threat. Okay, Greg, I know you've worked with the UN Human Rights Council and you've observed the uh, positions of the US government in meetings of the Human Rights Council. Could you talk about the Trump administration's policy regarding human rights in North Korea? What has the U.S. been doing in the Human Rights Council, for example? Well, uh, at the Human Rights Council, we haven't done anything for almost two years now because we have pulled out of the Human Rights Council. Uh, for re reasons not related to North Korea, of course, some of us, uh, I, I agree with some of those reasons. There are some terrible violators of human rights who sit on the Human Rights Council. That said, if there was one success story of the Human Rights Council that was the establishment of the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the DPRK, the UNCOI, uh, the, the resolution that established the UNCOI was passed by consensus. All 47 member states in uh, February 2013, one year prior to the, uh, the issuing of the UNCOI report. Of course, uh, the, uh, the Human Rights Council is also to be credited for the existence of a UN Special Rapporteur on the, the human rights situation in the DPRK. Um, Mr. Tomas Ojea Quintana from Argentina is the current rapporteur. He was preceded by uh, Vitit Muntarporn initially, a uh, professor from Thailand, uh, Marzuki Darisman, former attorney general of Indonesia. So uh, that's the, the Human Rights Council. Of course, we all do remember that up until the Pyeongchang Olympics, the administration was 
quite active on uh, North Korean human rights. Uh, the president gave a, a very good speech before the, the South Korean National Assembly in um, November prior to the, uh, the Pyeongchang Olympics, November 2017. We remember the disabled North Korean escapee activist, Chi Song Ho was the guest of the first lady at the State of the Union address. Uh, the president subsequently met with uh, a group of eight, including Chi Song Ho, eight North Korean escapees in the Oval Office. Vice President Pence met with um, the, the parents of Otto Warmbier, Fred and Cindy, who also participated in the State of the Union address. Uh, by the way, just a few days ago, we commemorated 10, day, 10 years since the sinking of the Tonan by the North Koreans. Vice President Pence, um, North Korean escapees, and the family of Otto Warmbier visited the Tonan Memorial in early 2018. The situation has been very different since the Pyeongchang Olympics. Perhaps this happened before across multiple administrations. Human rights has been outcompeted by other concerns, political, security, military concerns, North Korea's nukes and missiles. Um, the United States was part of uh, a coalition of like-minded states that pushed for significant action at the United Nations. Uh, three times in uh, December uh, 2015, 2016, and 2017, the North Korean human rights issue was placed on the agenda of the UN Security Council. This is a procedural matter requiring nine out of 15 votes of permanent and non-permanent members. In 2018, this didn't happen. We didn't have the votes. In 2019, just a few months ago, uh, the United States was uh, at the forefront of efforts to um, put together a coalition to support uh, the placing of North Korean human rights on the agenda of the UN Security Council. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. It didn't happen based on what I know precisely because we decided to change our mind at the last hour and this didn't happen. So efforts uh, by the State Department in particular to support North Korean human rights organizations have continued, especially in South Korea. The, the South Korean government, progressive leaning government of President Moon Jae-in has been very keen on appeasing the Kim regime on um, rapprochement at any cost. Human rights organizations, human rights activists, in particular defector activists have been sacrificed on the altar of so-called inner Korean reconciliation. The funding previously provided by the South Korean government to these organizations was cut 100%. They no longer uh, appear publicly as much as they used to. Uh, very tragically, just a few months ago, two North Korean sailors were repatriated by the South Korean government to North Korea, despite the constitution of South Korea, the Republic of Korea, that states that all Koreans are citizens of the Republic of Korea, they will return to conditions of extraordinary danger to a place where they were surely tortured, uh, perhaps killed, imprisoned. Uh, we, we can only think the worst based on North Korea's record. So it's important that the US State Department has continued to support these groups in South Korea. However, it is also important that we have US leadership significant action at the UN and elsewhere cannot happen without US leadership. Without US leadership, there can be no coalition of the like-minded supporting, supporting significant action at the General Assembly or the, the, uh, the UN uh, Security Council. We have seen others pull out of the coalition of the like-minded. Of course, the South Koreans for the first time in so many years, they did not co-sponsor the General Assembly resolution last year in the fall, and even the government of Japan that has been such a staunch supporter of, of action on human rights in North Korea, uh, probably for the sake of pursuing this ever elusive goal of a summit meeting between Prime Minister Abe and Kim Jong-un, even the government of Japan has taken its foot 
off the gas pedal. Mark, I'd yes. like to underline one thing that Greg mentioned, and that is the United States was the country that made the decision not to support taking up North Korea's human rights issues in the UN Security Council, and the US per blocked what would have happened. It takes, as Greg said, it takes nine votes of Security Council members to put an item on the agenda. There were eight countries in addition to the United States. Those eight countries supported doing it. It was the United States that basically blocked taking the issue up in the Security Council. The effort to, to raise these uh, human rights issues, the State Department in an institutional way continues to press the North Koreans on human rights. The annual human rights reports are as good as ever in terms of documenting, uh, enumerating what the issues and problems are. And the fact that they're quoting HRNK so frequently indicates how good they are. Uh, but the fact that when the report came out, None of the senior State Department officials who usually comment on issues and problems mentioned North Korea. Uh, so, I mean, it's the kind of thing that institutionally is done at a lower level, but when you get to the most senior officials, they ignore uh, the North Korean human rights issue. One area where there is still interest and concern is in the Congress. And the Congress continues to have a concern and an interest about the human rights situation in North Korea. And there's more pressure from Congress than any place else in the US government. But with all of the other things going on these days, it's very difficult to get uh, movement beyond that. If yes. I, please, uh, Mark and, and Bob, if I may, um, I will quote a very senior expert. I cannot name him. I don't have his uh, permission to do this. Bob knows him very well. You know him very well, Mark. He made this point uh, that the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, a couple of weeks ago, gave a very good statement on human rights in the DPRK. However, as this most distinguished human right, rights professional was noticing, the UN High Commissioner did not mention the UN COI report not even once. So the way that he put it is that everyone is now tiptoeing around the issue of North Korean human rights. This is not what we used to do, Bob, when, when you were there just, just a few years ago. This is not in the remote past. It hasn't been that long. Unfortunately, that's true. Yeah, I, I saw that when Secretary Pompeo um, did his public announcement of the rollout of the Human Rights Report this month, he singled out four countries for mention. Uh, publicly. He mentioned China, Cuba, Iran, and Venezuela. And not mention North Korea is striking in that, in that kind of company. And particularly since North Korea probably has a, a worse record on human rights than China. I mean, hard to believe, but probably does. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. Let me press this a little bit further, because I think we agree that the North Korean human rights should be raised and addressed and spotlighted. The administration chooses not to, and there must be a reason for it. And I assume the reason is because they believe that in the denuclearization talks, if the administration criticized human rights in North Korea, it would somehow endanger the talks. So uh, Bob, do you think that's valid? No, I don't think it's valid at all. I mean, the North Koreans respond far more negatively uh, than we've responded. And it certainly doesn't affect our ability to move forward. Uh, it was very interesting that when the president of the United States sent a message to Kim Jong-un, uh, Kim Jong-un himself didn't bother to respond. The response came from his sister. Uh, that really is an insult to the United States. And uh, it seems to me that the North Koreans uh, continue to insult the United States to uh, you know, ignore us, uh, to, uh, to carry on the way they do. And we don't seem to pay much attention to it. And we're pussyfooting around on human rights when we ought to press the North Koreans on human rights. Yeah, I think I might mention one more UN activity I think is notable. And that is the fact that the UN has an office in Seoul of the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights. And the job of that office in Seoul is to collect evidence of crimes against humanity and abuses of human rights for the day when it comes that there'll be some accountability for what happened in North Korea. So they interview defectors, they gather documents, they're quietly laying the groundwork for a very good documentation 
and if, if it can ever be used. Okay, I see three questions in our queue, but uh, while I wait for some others to come in, let me just ask a final question of my own. And this is for both of you. So could you say what the US and other countries should be doing in regard to North Korean human rights? Do you have any advice for organizations or individuals for what they might do? It seems to me that it's very important that we continue to raise the issue of human rights. The fact that we don't talk about it is the biggest problem. Uh, we need to, to raise the issue. The US government needs to officially raise it. Uh, Greg and other organizations, private organizations, uh, should continue to raise the human rights question, the human rights issues. Uh, but to ignore them, to underplay them, certainly does not help. And I think that's, that's one of the things that we need to do. I think members of Congress need to be more outspoken in terms of pressing the administration and pressing uh, the Secretary of State and other senior officials uh, to speak out on the issue of human rights. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, we can only hope will happen. Well, I presume that uh, all of those friends who have tuned in today have a keen interest in North Korea and North Korean human rights issues. Uh, there is a lot of competition out there. There are lots of other human rights crises, refugee crisis in the Mediterranean basin, South Asia. Of course, we are dealing with a global pandemic. We continue to deal with overwhelming security, military challenges. Uh, it is very important that in democratic countries, one should talk to elected representatives to remind them that this is an issue that continues to matter to the people of the United States, to the people uh, living in, uh, in other friendly and fellow democracies. As far as things on the ground are, are concerned, um, the people of North Korea need information. Uh, there is uh, a human rights public health continuum. We need to continue to convey to the people of North Korea information about the corruption of their leadership, information about the outside world, South Korea in particular, and also information about the abysmal state of human rights in North Korea. I'm quoting Hwang jang a lot today. As Hwang jang once said, I hear a lot outside the country about human rights violations, public executions being abysmal human rights violations. Never once did I hear the people of North Korea speaking of human rights violations while living in North Korea. I think that it is very important under the current circumstances to explain to the people of North Korea what is going on around the world with this pandemic. It is very important to explain to them that we do not have a cure, we do not have a vaccine. All we have is a set of procedures and behavior change measures aim to, well, flatten the curve. That's an expression we hear a lot these days to avoid public health systems being, public and private health systems being overwhelmed by this pandemic. Things are much worse in North Korea. And I think it is very important to explain to the people of North Korea via information campaigns run by civil society organizations that human rights is public health, public health is human rights. Through its abuse of human rights, through its corruption, the regime of North Korea is placing the people of North Korea at great risk. And this is happening in sharp contrast to what we've seen happening in South Korea, of course, not a perfect way of dealing and coping with this pandemic, but surely the South Koreans have been at the forefront of dealing and coping with this global challenge. Okay, I guess my thought would be that uh, I think the silence actually could be misleading. You know, when the Trump administration doesn't re remind people of human rights problems, and when the public sees the president referring to Kim Jong-un as a great guy who cares about his country, I mean, people may assume that things are getting better in North Korea. The human rights is a problem that's being resolved. And the other argument I hear is that because of marketization, which is going on in North Korea, that means there must be a better human rights life for people because they're involved in private enterprise now that must help. But as that uh, May 2019 UN report pointed out, it 
actually could be worse because the public has to be in danger of breaking the law when they're engaged in market activities. They can be picked up at any time. Okay, let me turn to questions now. Uh, we have a question from uh, Courtney, Cortland, who asked if there are any updates on NGOs, UN organizations, or others working inside North Korea currently, especially those working on outbreak preparedness. What are they reporting? I don't think we have seen uh, any specific reporting so far. Um, of course, humanitarian organizations have been trapped in this predicament for many years now. Many of them, all of them are doing good work. Many of them are doing God's work. They're faith-based organizations. We're all familiar with the great work that Steve Linton has been doing, for example, in North Korea, dealing with another tremendous public health challenge multi-drug resistant tuberculosis one also has to remember that the work of these organizations and we, we of course don't have the time to get into a discussion on how effective this is uh how effective it is in terms of reaching out to the most vulnerable uh, uh, th there are success stories as well uh, but the point is that these organizations need access inside the country in order to do their work they have to be very careful especially under the current circumstances any statement might jeopardize their visas might jeopardize their access might jeopardize their very work inside the country we have received sporadic reports from other media organizations, most notably Daily NK. Mark, you are on that um, really good um, conference call that, uh, that Link organized last week. I and probably others asked a question about the reported outbreak of respiratory disease at camp number 12, Chonggori in uh, Northeastern North Korea. Their answer was very frank. They said, look, th there is no way we can verify this we know nothing about testing, plus the, the, the state of uh, health security is so precarious in North Korea, especially at these detention facilities, that it's really difficult to tell whether this is coronavirus or some other type of uh, pulmonary respiratory infection. So reports are sporadic. We have seen statements by the, the Secretary General of the UN, by the, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, but again, nothing from the North Korean regime. So far, they claim that there are zero cases. And I should have begun by saying that my wish to the people of North Korea is that they really have zero cases. There are no acceptable deaths. Uh, there is no acceptable death rate. Every death from this terrible global pandemic is a tragic death. And I, I wish the people of North Korea only the best. Mark, can we turn Please. the question around and ask Court if he has any information about what's going on in, in North Korea? He's, got, he's done some very good studies on some of the healthcare issues inside North Korea. I'm wondering if he's heard anything. So Courtland, if you're out there, please feel free to chat in, please. Okay, uh, different question now from Anonymous. It says, recently in Asia or Europe, uh, tourism to North Korea has been getting more trendy, uh, reportedly providing outsiders insights into North Korea to help opening up. It's also channeling foreign, foreign currency to the regime. So does foreign tourism help or hurt the human rights issue in your opinion? Right now, I'd say there probably is very little tourism going yeah. into North Korea. At this, uh, yeah, this week. Uh, the longer term question is uh, tourism helpful or harmful? I'd say overall, uh, fairly limited <clears throat> benefits. Uh, the tourism that's going on or that has been going on past in, into North Korea has been extremely tightly controlled by the North Koreans. People aren't allowed to go into North Korea and chat with people in the street and people in the street aren't going to chat uh, openly and freely about what uh, what's going on in their lives. There's not really an exchange of information. It's a source of income to the North Korean government, and people who go there and uh, are, are traveling are, are paying a reasonably good price uh, to be able to do that, and it benefits the North Korean regime. 
I think the benefits of, of travel are very, very limited. And uh, seeing a few foreign tourists, particularly there for the Pyongyang Marathon, are not going to do a lot for improving conditions in North Korea. Yeah. I saw the marathon was canceled this year because of the concerns yes. about the coronavirus. And if I uh, may, Mark and Bob, um, both of you mentioned uh, the 2019 U.S. State Department uh, report on the situation of human rights in the DPRK. Uh, for the first time ever, the State Department report uh, included the case of Otto Warmbier, who died at the hands of the North Korean regime. No, uh, Otto Warmbier was on a tour to North Korea when he was arbitrarily arrested, imprisoned, his imprisonment in North Korea resulted in his being sent back home more than a year later in a vegetative, vegetative state. He passed away one week later. Uh, other Americans had been detained before that. And of course, Bob, you had to deal with this as a U.S. Special Envoy for Human Rights in North Korea. Um, so it, it is simply dangerous. Uh, and American tourists in particular are a target if you talk to North Korean escapees, if you talk to senior defectors, escapees in particular, they will tell you that from a very young age, North Koreans are taught that America and Americans are the enemy. Of course, some of them see the light and understand what's going on, but one must really understand that traveling to North Korea is dangerous. A second aspect, full disclosure, I have endorsed and shared a petition currently ongoing on change.org. This is a petition initiated by a very good and close friend of mine who's a North Korean escapee. It's a petition to urge the international community to boycott attending mass games in North Korea. Egregious human rights violations happen during these public mobilization campaigns aimed at staging these massive mass games, in particular, children are victimized. Children become the victims of human rights violations during these mass games. The North Korean regime makes it a point to have foreign travelers participate as, um, as, as viewers uh, in these mass games as a tool of delivering regime propaganda using tourism to North Korea as a vehicle. So fundamentally, uh, under the current circumstances, until North Korea adopts comprehensive economic, social, political reform, travel to North Korea is a bad idea. Okay, I see the Cortland's replied by chat to the panelists, so you can see what he's uh, replying to Bob's question. Let me ask you a question about terminology, because Greg, you used the term um, escapee for North Koreans. It seems like a defector is the usual term used. I hear refugee used. I hear escapee used. What's the best term to use for these people who are just Koreans who have managed to get out of North Korea? Certainly in the case of uh, those who came to South Korea um, before and during the Korean War, the term a refugee is the most appropriate. Uh, refugee uh, cannot be appropriately applied to others. Again, according to the Constitution of the Republic of Korea, every Korean is a citizen of the Republic of Korea. Mm -hmm. Every square inch of Korean land is the land of uh, the national territory of the Republic of Korea. Certainly in the case of very high profile uh, North Koreans who escaped and came to South Korea, the term defector might apply because uh, the term defector, we hear this a lot from human rights organizations and human rights activists who used to be involved in dealing with the, uh, the human rights violations perpetrated by communist regimes in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Bob is really, really well familiar with that world, having done that work. Um, so uh, basically the term defector has a certain connotation. This is uh, a, a turncoat, somebody who turned against the regime, a senior military official, a senior government official, but certainly in the case of say, a, a Taeyong Ho who was uh, minister uh, at, at the, um, was DCM deputy chief of mission at the DPRK embassy in London, in the case of Hwang Jang-yop, 
was the top ideologue of North Korea in the case of ambassadors and other senior officials who ended up in South Korea or other places, the term defector will apply. In the case of the overwhelming majority of those 33,000 North Koreans currently residing in South Korea, others residing in other countries, perhaps SKP is a, a better term to apply. They all escaped from um, oppression. They all escaped a terrible regime. One can, can make a very good argument that the entire country of North Korea is one gigantic gulag. It is only the level of repression and oppression that differs. Otherwise, in many ways, everyone is imprisoned in this predicament of, of the Kim regime. Okay, uh, Bob, do you have a term you prefer to use for Koreans who've managed to escape North Korea? Uh, the, the South Korean terms, and, and I don't speak Korean, but my understanding is the South Korean terms are focused more on the refugee aspect than they are on the defector aspect, which is the term we tend to use in English. But as Greg mentioned, it has the ideological uh, content that for some people is appropriate, but for a lot of them it's not. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what we call them is probably less relevant than uh, the fact that these are people who are getting away from uh, a, a regime that has made their life painful. And uh, whatever we call them, we need to be helpful and supportive of them. Okay, all right. And I, I think that that is a very important point that Ambassador King raised. What is the Korean terminology used? Most, well, all North Korean escapees refer to themselves as Talbukcha, Talturada to escape, book from Pukan, North Korea, Cha individual, one who escaped from North Korea. The word for defector is Mangmyongja. Very few of them refer to themselves as Mangmyongja. They will refer to themselves as Talbukcha. As Bob was saying, the South Korean government has experimented with other terms, Setomin, uh, New Settler, and so on and so forth. That didn't stick. So as far as the North Koreans residing there are concerned, probably SKP is the term that comes closest, I guess. But again, as Bob was saying, this, this could be an, an ongoing discussion, an ongoing debate. Okay, that, that's helpful. Another question we have in is, uh, in light of the pandemic, is there anything we can do to force North Korea to properly care for the populations due to the global nature of the pandemic? That one's a tough one because uh, we're not in a position to force North Korea to provide for its own citizens. This is an obligation that every state ought to have. Seems to me the best thing that we can do is to emphasize the responsibility of the government to take care of the well being of its own citizens and uh, focus on that, that element of it. Uh, most other countries are very sensitive and very attentive about their, the well being of their citizens. Uh, the North Koreans give very little attention to the well being of the vast majority of their citizens, and uh, the elite, uh, of course, get very very special attention. Uh, but I think what we've got to do is, is focus on the responsibility of a government to its own people and to their well-being. And this goes well beyond uh, simply the pandemic. And I think that's where we start getting into the issue of human rights. If a government is concerned about the well-being of its people, it's not only their health, it's also the other aspects of, of the human rights, access to information, uh, ability to make choices, freedom of movement, uh, the other kinds of things that we talk about. Perhaps as uh, shown by precedent, there isn't much we can do to force the Kim regime to look after its own people. One has to remember that globally we are dealing with a frightening, devastating force of nature. Uh, this coronavirus crisis will make many of us, even in the developed world, uh, the world of uh, constitutional republics or liberal democracies, perhaps change our perspectives on the world and change our way of life. As far as we know of now, we do not have a cure we do not have a vaccine. The only way we can flatten the curve is by 
means of using uh, behavior change campaigns. And of course, social distancing is one of the tools employed in the arsenal of dealing with COVID-19. Here's potentially a very big challenge for the North Korean regime. The North Korean regime fundamentally relies on collectivism. Collectivism and social distancing do not mix. Remember that this is a regime that relies on mass indoctrination of its own people. Of course, the regime might tell them, stop drinking soju and stop going to theaters. But what about the weekly Senghua Tsonghua ideological training sessions? Will those stop as well? North Korea for more than seven decades has been all about people living together and everybody watching everybody else and everybody being subject to multiple lines of surveillance, coercion, control, surveillance, and punishment. Can this collectivism, collective surveillance, collective oppression, collective punishment survive a coronavirus crisis? None of us know the answer. Um, many still wonder how come how come uh, the regime did not collapse in the 1990s? Um, again, and please remember my wish to the people of North Korea. Uh, again, zero cases, zero fatalities. Let's think uh, of an absolutely potentially devastating scenario where perhaps almost half the population, 10 million have been infected due to precarious hygiene, precarious public health. And let's assume a, a high, fatality rate. What the World Health Organization is, is saying uh, right now is two to four percent, let's assume five percent. Five percent of 10 million would be 500,000. That's how many people died in 1995 during the famine, according to Huang zhang -yop. According to the same Huang zhang 10 percent of them were party members, 50,000 of them. Well, if that did not bring down the regime. Does it mean that the regime is prepared to deal and cope with, with that type of tremendous loss? We just don't know. These are all questions that will be answered. But I think that the, the, the million dollar question, please excuse the cliche, is whether the collectivism preached by the North Korean regime can coexist with the type of behavior change that's needed in order to flatten the curve and avoid a catastrophic spread of the disease in North Korea? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. I'm not sure the 1990s will teach us much about what would happen today. I think things are different now. In the 1990s, uh, the huge part of the population that relied on the state to save them from the famine died. And those who were prepared to scramble for some kind of resources of their own, who were more, more entrepreneurial survived. So if, the, if it happened today that there was a real disaster in North Korea, and this could be it, I'm not sure how much the population would actually really believe the state would rest to save them and how many would try to find their own means of survival. Um, okay. See, so what's another question we have in is, and this is getting very Washington DC-ish, what would a Biden policy on North Korea look like? <laughs> uh. Unfortunately, I don't think North Korea is the top of the list on either side uh, in terms of uh, upcoming presidential election. Uh, my sense is that there's a greater attention to human rights, uh, likely uh, from a Biden administration. And in part, that's because I think with a Biden administration, there's, it's less likely to be the very personal kind of approach uh, that Trump has taken. It's not based on a Trump, uh, you know, the, the Trump administration policy is largely based on, on the personal relationship between Trump and Kim Jong-un. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the case with Biden. I think there's going to be, uh, if, if there's a Biden administration, I think it's going to be much more uh, the kind of traditional U.S. government approach where you look at the policies, you make the determinations, and it's not the personalities that try to make the difference. Uh, and from that point of view, I think it'll be more, more focused 
on the concrete actions that are taken in terms of dealing with the nuclear issue and uh, the importance of human rights is likely to come through more in that kind of an administration than one where it's a uh, uh, very personality driven. Yeah, it, I, I, go ahead, Greg, I'm sorry. In my view, regardless of the result of the presidential election, uh, the human rights issue in North Korea will be again elevated. Uh, should President Trump be reelected, I think it would be reasonable to expect a harder line approach to North Korea. As Bob said, uh, should we see a Biden presidency, it is likely that we will see a, a human rights component included in, uh, in our policy toward North Korea. So again, one in this line of work, North Korean human rights, human rights in general, but in particular North Korean human rights has to be an optimist. I, I have to be optimistic regarding the future. Yeah, I, I agree that the, uh, if there were a Biden administration, it would be more traditional approach. It would probably go back to working groups, special envoys, empowering negotiators. I mean, for me, the question has never been whether uh, uh, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un trust each other. It's whether they each trust their own bureaucracies enough to be able to actually negotiate an agreement. <laughs> it's, it's a harder thing to do. It might be a more multilateral too. I can see a Biden administration trying to create more of a network again, working with Japan, with South Korea, with Australia, with Russia, with China, with the EU, to try to pressure North Korea. And I think with the Biden administration, there will be a different attitude towards the United Nations. I think the United States will resume membership in the UN uh, Human Rights Council. I think we'll play a much more active role uh, in terms of pressing the North Korea uh, human rights issue in the United Nations the way we have in the past. You know, if I had a wish for the next administration or even this one, I'd like to see him introduce human rights on the agenda with North Korea, but maybe in very specific ways. Maybe try to find some small step where you actually get something to happen, just as a beginning. So rather than saying you must improve your human rights record, which is unlikely to happen, we could say, uh, would you please change your law so that family members of those who are imprisoned aren't imprisoned with you? That'd be a start, just something they might be able to do. Regrettably, Mark, that is extrajudicial punishment. There are no laws in the book stipulating that family members be imprisoned together with a perceived offender. They simply round it up and taken away in the middle of the night. Uh, okay, let me take uh, one more question. I think we'll wrap it up. The other question I have in the queue is, what do we think would happen if members of the elite in North Korea caught um, uh, the, the coronavirus? Would that be more inclined to make them reach for outside assistance? Would it change their attitude? It's certainly going to be a concern to Kim Jong-un, who's got to maintain the loyalty of the elite. And I think he's going to be very concerned about that. The difficulty is uh, you can do some things to prevent the spread of the virus, which is what he's trying to do by uh, uh, enhancing the uh, limitations on movement and that kind of thing. Uh, the availability of uh, respirators uh, seems to be the biggest uh, issue, I think, that, that is likely to come up. And I'm not sure that there is much ability for the rest of the world to provide respirators to North Korea. When look, you look at the situation in the United States and the availability of respirators here, we're far below what we're going to need. Uh, and I'm not sure that that situation is different anywhere else. Uh, is, is there much that can be done? And are there available resources that can be helpful to North Korea in dealing with the virus? I'm not sure there's that much that can be done. Uh, one of the things that probably is most helpful is sharing information. And this is something where uh, we're quite willing to share healthcare information and most other nations are willing to do so. But are the North Koreans willing to share information as to what their situation is? Uh, and only if they share information are other countries going to be able to offer suggestions and help and advice and potentially uh, some uh, material assistance to be able to deal with it. Uh, I'm not sure what what the, the result will be and whether there's that much that can actually make a difference. I 
also think that we have to keep in mind the very nature of the Kim regime in North Korea. This is not a regime keen on preserving, on safeguarding the, the human security, including the health security and human rights of its own people. Its fundamental strategic objective is its own survival. Does the regime want its people to die by the millions? Absolutely not. However, if what it takes is to sacrifice its own people by the millions, it will do it in the blink of an eye as it has done it before. What if the elites were concerned about coronavirus? Again, let us remember the nature of the regime. Where did General Lee Kam Yong go? Oh, he's been quarantined. He has coronavirus. Where did the other 15 generals go? Well, they've been quarantined as well, together with their entire extended families, out of concern for the public health of North Korea. So that's the, the other very unfortunate side of what a, a public health crisis, what a coronavirus crisis may look like in North Korea. This may tragically provide the, the regime with, with, with a cover to do what it's been doing for a very long time, oppressing its own people, leading, uh, staying in power through fear politic, through the politics of fear. And this applies first and foremost to the very elites of North Korea. Yeah, I saw some reports, true or not, that uh, Kim Jong-un has left Pyongyang. So he will take care of himself. I, I don't have to worry about him so much personally. All right, uh, I think our time's almost up. So let me just ask um, Bob and Greg, do you have any last things you'd like to say before I close this out? I'd like to say thank you to you, Mark. I think you've done a great job in terms of moderating this event. Uh, I'm struck that it's an interesting format to use and, and under the circumstances, I think you've done a great job. I, I would also like to join Ambassador King in thanking you, Mark, and uh, your team at KEI. I know that uh, everyone uh, at KEI has put a lot of good and hard work into this for the past. Um, my parting... uh -oh. well, we are all in a very difficult situation. Uh, we are faced with a global pandemic. It is very easy to forget about the people of North Korea. It is very easy to forget that crimes against humanity in North Korea are still being perpetrated. It is very easy to forget that a slow motion refugee crisis has been ongoing for many years. Um, I am grateful to you, Mark, to your team, to you, Bob, and to all those who have tuned in today, it is very important to know that uh, the people of North Korea are not forgotten. And I would ask everyone who has tuned in today to continue to be an ambassador of North Korean human rights. We need your help. Please spread the word. Okay, thank you. That's a great note to end on. So let me just thank you, Greg and Bob, for taking your time to participate. Uh, I think it was a good, good event. We're going to be doing more of these. So Please, for those of you who watched or participated, uh, thank you for tuning in to us. Uh, keep an eye on our website, keia.org, to see announcements of future events coming up. Okay, so thanks much. Uh, thank you, Judy. <laughs>